Hello everyone, my name is Ryan Kerr. I'm the producer on the Townsend's YouTube channel. I'm also in some of the videos and play some music in the background. You all know John Townsend. Uh, we've been talking recently about how there are a lot of viewers on the channel that don't understand why we do this or where it all started. We wanted to have a quick, not so much an interview, but a conversation just to kind of fill in some of the gaps of knowledge there. So we'll just get started. Hey John. Morning Ryan. So we're, what, 400-ish cooking videos in? At least. Okay. At least. So why cooking videos and why do we keep doing that other than it's turned into a business? Uh, we started making videos on YouTube back in 2008. And uh, we started off with videos that were about instruction of products, the kinds of things we sell in our uh, e-commerce business. And uh, we people wanted more information about the time period and what was going on. And one of the best ways to connect with history is cooking. So it took us a while to kind of find our feet and say, oh, cooking episodes, that will help people understand history. But uh, once we started off with cooking, it just took off. Oh, what was the first cooking one that took off? Do you remember? Uh, we did. We started off with a series that had uh, soldiers' rations and then soldier cooking. So that first series was mm -hmm. sort of out in the uh, out at, a, at a campsite, and we were kind of camp cooking at the beginning. When those first soldier videos were coming out, was that based a lot off of the Joseph Plum Martin book? Is that where that kind of came into play for some, you? Some of that, and, okay. and just standard uh, records that we have of exactly what the soldiers were given as provisions, you know. So each week they were given, you know, so many pounds of beef, so many pounds of salt pork, mm. uh, you know, flour, those sorts of things. And it's like, well, okay, what are soldiers going to do if this is all you're given? as food and you're get, not giving it to you as a as a you know a cooked dish how are you going to take these raw materials with very very simple tools uh and what are you going to turn them into right. so so then eventually it just morphed into generalized cooking after you ran out of ideas for soldier food or well it really had to do with what happened uh, we started shooting those soldier cooking things in the fall uh, we shot maybe a dozen episodes or so. They became much more popular than we expected. Mm -hmm. And so we immediately had to retool and say, okay, it's winter time. I'm not going to stay outside and cook uh, for right. another, you know, another 20 <laughs> episodes. So we built the German kitchen. We said, let's start to do what cooking is like inside a normal household. Um, this gives us a chance to, you know, cook up off the ground mm -hmm. and uh, we can cook all sorts of things. We can look at English cookery, we can look at German cookery, some French cookery uh, of our time period. How different is it? How similar is it to cooking today? And boy, we've learned a lot. Yeah, <laughs> right. So uh, I know everything with you that I've experienced, you don't do anything until you research it pretty well. Yeah. Even with the German kitchen, I wasn't around when you built that, but you told me that you even traveled around to look at other examples of kitchens, right? Well, I had already visited uh, the Frontier Culture Museum in, um, in Stanton, uh, Virginia, and that museum has a, a German house from the 18th century that they've transported there to that site, and it has a kitchen very, very similar to this. And there are, there were in the 18th century, some houses, especially um, German immigrants that would come in, they would build houses similar to that here in North America. None of those really exist anymore. They've all been mm. sort of, okay. you know, taken apart. Uh, so we had to look at an actual German house to <laughs> see what the kitchen was like. And then uh, this used to be a chicken house. Yeah, this is just a, a simple outbuilding that we had here that wasn't really being used. At one point, it was a chicken house. That was what it was built for. Uh, but we repurposed it and turned it into. So some people think there's a whole, you know, whole house that's here. Right. <laughs> it's really just half of the kitchen uh, so that we can you know, do, uh, do our camera work over there. And, and mm -hmm. this side is the 18th century. So flash forward a few years. I don't know when cooking became a regular. We're going to put a lot of cooking videos out. 2008 is when you started. Mm -hmm. When did cooking become the thing? Um, it was probably at the end of 2011, okay. I believe. Yes, so we, we finished up some bigger projects in 2011 and we didn't quite know what was next. The channel was doing okay, 
But um, mm -hmm. so we, I had already done one or two cooking episodes and didn't really ignore, I didn't really, you know, pay attention too much about how popular they were. But it turned out that as I looked back in that uh, history of the channel, the one or two cooking episodes that we did, did very well. And mm -hmm. if I would have been, you know, quicker on the uptake, I would have realized that's where <laughs> we should have been all along. Okay. As, as soon as we um, kind of caught our stride on that and kind of knew what we were doing, uh, the, the channel was doing well and we really started to get very, very consistent. So at the, at the beginning, we would have kind of lulls in the channel where we wouldn't put out anything for, you know, a couple of weeks or a month. Um, mm -hmm. But YouTube really likes consistency right. and the audience likes very, you know, consistent thing. I want to see a video every week. Right. And so we started to really... Uh, concentrate on on making very very consistent uh, content each week and uh, we started experimenting with um, uh, some outdoor videos and started getting creative and one in that series was fried chicken and that was the first video that we had that really took the channel and and just sent it just rocketing who knows where yeah, yeah it was exactly just, it was kind of crazy if you guys don't know out there fried chicken Got a million views in 24 hours, and it was the first video that was just like, wow, this is, we don't know what to do with this. So at that point, I think that that's kind of when it opened up and it's like, okay, this is going to give us lots of opportunities to do mm -hmm. different kinds of videos. We started visiting some historic sites. Right. We started working on bigger projects. So it wasn't too long after that. Maybe, was it about a year, year and a half that we decided to do Dugout Canoe? Um, I don't, I, like I don't recall. That was in the... Maybe at the end of 2018 we did that. So. I think so. And then uh, it eventually led to building a log cabin. Yeah, there's there was a, an opportunity there where we said, okay, you know, now that we're 200 cooking episodes in, maybe we need to branch out a little bit. Uh, you just can't right. do the same thing forever. It really you start to burn out on that. And we said, okay, it's now it's time to re-expand back out and look at. Uh, instructional videos. Let's look at some bigger projects. The canoe project was a, a big project that, that went over four separate episodes and we took months yeah. on that project <clears throat> basically. Mm -hmm. um, the log cabin project was even bigger in its um, investment of time for us but those give us again new new places to shoot videos. They, they're like building sets but they're also the right. experience which is the important part of what we do here on the channel. We want to do the things, not just sort of look at the pictures or pretend that we're doing them, but actually do them. So we know what it was like to, even though we can't totally step into their shoes, we can almost step into their shoes. Uh, yeah, right. I think that we even will do that to our own detriment sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like I know that, so burning the canoe, right? We did that, we did a stage of burning and realized this makes it more difficult to right. chop because it makes the wood spongy. But we still went on and burned it more because we knew that that was a part of history that we needed to experience. Right. There's a certain amount of understanding, and you we learn it in the process. Like right. the canoe, yeah. it's like, well, you chop for a while, and then you should do some burning, and that smooths it out. It doesn't make it easier to cut. Um, it can harden the wood, make it harder to cut out at different places, and and burn too much if you're not careful mm -hmm. but it's one of the tools they used and so it's like yeah we could have we could have brought in you know modern tools we could have brought in sanders and and whatnot but no let's let's do this the way they did it uh, chop at it even if it's you know hard um, try burning learn how the burning process is um, some of those things you need a lot of experience and we can't we don't have enough time to gain that experience mm -hmm. you know i can't be a an apprentice to a trade for right. seven years before I'm, you know, competent at really doing it. So uh, sometimes we, we can't emulate those things perfectly and we have to, you know, bring in some modern tools. But whenever possible, we want to do it like they did in the 18th century. Yeah, I don't think that any of us were, it wasn't like it was the first time we'd ever used an axe, but we hadn't done anything <laughs> like that with an axe, yeah. right? And if we hadn't done the canoe and, and learned you know, some axe work there, I think that we would have been up a creek without yeah. paddle when it came to the cabin. That's pretty funny. Good it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, because the axe work was much more precise that we right. needed to do with the cabin. 
And yeah. you said that you would have wanted to do a cabin for oh. a long yeah. time. Right. right. Even even before like this project, the German kitchen, okay. it's like, well, wouldn't it be great if we could shoot videos in a log cabin? Okay. Uh, but that takes a lot more work than right. it cre- than to create this. Do you think that we ever, or not we, do you think you ever would have been able to or had the time to do that had it not been for, we can turn this into videos for the YouTube channel? I just don't think it, it would ever have worked out like that. There's just, it's such a big investment in time. Uh, it, would, it would have had to have been a personal project and it's hard to make a log cabin by yourself. Right, and uh, uh, that's a big personal project. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, try to explain that to the people around. Yeah, I'm just yeah, it's gonna... like, oh, I'm gonna spend another year <laughs> on this cabin. See you guys, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about historic sites. We've been able to go to quite a few and work at them and experience things. What about historic sites makes you get excited? The historic sites are, uh, there's several different things going on there. It's not just one thing. And one of the neat things about most of historic sites is this is where history actually happened. So you can step into a place, you know, if you go to Mount Vernon, it's like, I'm walking down this path. George Washington walked down this path at some point, Um, probably lots and lots of times. Uh, So there's that part of a historic site. Many of them have original buildings and uh, we can look at not just a, an idea about how something was made. Um, like when I built the German kitchen, I knew I, could, I walked right. in that yeah. kitchen. It's like, okay, the beams are like this. Uh, isn't this hearth a very interesting design, etc. cetera. So uh, it, it gives us a chance to look at the real things of history. And then usually there's some amazing people on the staff that have knowledge that you just will not get anywhere else. They've been concentrating on that for so many years. Now, the funny thing is, is a lot of those folks don't get to talk about those things. They're deep knowledge. Yeah. Regular people come in and they tell the same five minute story over and over again. So normally in their everyday work, they only need to know about this much because mm-hmm. people walk in, they walk out again. But, but that kind of a job is a passion project. Yes. And, and so when somebody like us comes in, and we're interested in the stuff that's not surface level, right? We yeah. want to go deeper. Man, do they light up. Yeah, yeah. They light up and they just want to just go and go and go. And, you know, uh, and, it, and it spurs them on to be even more interested. As someone like us comes along, interviews them or just talks to them about them, that they get more excited about that. And they want to do even more research. As, you know, two people interact, it mm. spurs both of them on to greater thoughts. What are you excited to be able to do with the channel other than make videos? The channel does, um, a, I think the, the neatest thing about the channel is that there's interaction with the audience, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we can just make content that, you know, it's like, oh, I'm interested in this thing, I'm interested in that thing. But we can also get this feedback from people. So most like the old style television, they didn't really have that choice. They would just say, I, I think the audience wants to, to know about this and they would give them that content. But we get instant feedback. Right. So, you know, I can, I can look at the comments on a video and, and the very next video, I can adjust what we do and create content for that. Uh, that happens even even more quickly in a live stream. Someone answers, asks us a question, and boom, you know, we can immediately start to say, "Oh, I don't know about that. I need to research that." Or, "Oh, here's here's what I know about that. Um, you know, maybe I can't answer the question perfectly, or you know, in totality, but I can give them a little kernel or an idea about where to go with that." So, I think the outward. Um, of part of that understanding the audience and interacting with the audience is is very very powerful and even watching what happens when audience members talk to each yeah, other yeah, is very fun. very fun too so uh, there's a lot that goes in um, I mean I'm I'm amazed by what happens with the channel I never never expected it to do what it has done mm-hmm. and it you know, uh, people all around the world interact with our content. So it's, it's yeah. amazing. So many examples of history teachers saying, hey, I used your videos in our class, mm. or people saying, I used your earthen oven video to yeah. build one. What, is that, what does that do for you? Like when, when it's like, oh, no, this is going past, I'm learning about history, but this is a tool for my life. I don't, I don't think about that a lot. Okay. Um, I let, you know, a lot of my own 
kind of, oh, I'm interested in this, guide where the channel goes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some steering that comes from the outside when, when there's comments or, you know, obviously the entire team that we have here. It's not just me who comes up with ideas. Right. So uh, there's a lot of that, but I, I don't want to also spend too much thinking, oh, this is doing some amazing thing. It's like, no, keep, keep doing what you're doing, you know, keep concentrating uh, here and, and not let too much of that I mean, I don't want to get a big head or think right. that, that somehow we're doing something that we're special, you know. I think that there are a lot of people that watch the YouTube channel that don't understand that there's a retail section to this business, this company, right? And before the YouTube channel was ever a thought, because YouTube didn't exist, right. <laughs> this was a retail company. Um, let's talk a little bit about how that came and, and how you came into it. So we started YouTube videos at the end of 2008, but my father started the business that creates all this way back in 1973. Next year will be 50 years that we've been in this business in one form or another, which is pretty incredible. Uh, he, uh, about 1980, he sort of uh, pivoted the country, uh, company into uh, uh, specifically oriented toward the Revolutionary War time period and reenactors that were doing that. So that was right in that, that bicentennial time period. There were a lot of uh, Revolutionary War reenactors. They needed uh, all sorts of things. They needed camping equipment. They needed outfits. They needed shirts and pants and shoes and tricorn hats. Uh, so uh, we did all the research uh, to make those sorts of things and uh, had created a little catalog and, and uh, sold items for years and years. So some people thought that that reenacting was just going to die in 1981 because Eight, uh, 1781 was the end of the Revolutionary War time period, but mm -hmm. that did not happen. There were a lot of people that were excited. They went on to do War of 1812 and uh, Corps of, of uh, Exploring, the Lewis and Clark people. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different historical reenactors. We serve a, a much wider time period than just the Revolutionary War time period. And uh, just all that research for making those products, selling them to people, um, we would constantly be doing research on new items, new products, and that's where the core of the, you know, the um, historical information comes from. It's like, oh, well, we need books on this type of product, and why did they have it, and all that kind of good stuff. Mm -hmm. So when I was growing up in school, going to history classes, I always loved history, but I didn't really care to memorize the dates of specific battles and understand um, different, you know, when the speeches happened and yeah. all that kind of thing. And, and it wasn't so much focused on just like the, the highlighted folks from the time period. And when I started working here and I realized that that wasn't really what you guys focused on either. Right. I was super excited about that. But what ha, has that always been like that for you? Did you used to get excited about understanding military movements and how this battle was won and all of that? Or has it always been more about just the people in general of the time period? I have always been more interested in daily life of people in history than I am about the bigger events in political history. I think those are really, really important and not that we don't you know, understand that or think about that and know that they're important things, but we are regular people. Uh, you know, I'm not a president or, you know, a general or any of those things. So uh, for me to connect with people in history, I want to connect with the same kind of person I am in history. So, uh, you know, what's a, what's a normal everyday person's life like in the 18th century? And so that's the sort of uh, information that I'm driven to look for because that's, that's where I want to connect. That's the kind of person I can connect with in history. So Townsend is a small business. But we do kind of, we, we, we seem to ship all over the place as far as the retail side goes. We've already said that the people that view our, our YouTube channel live all over the world. But here we operate with something like 30 employees, is that right? Yes. For, for like everything? So we've been around for 50 years and we do, as, a, as an e-commerce business, sell things all around the world 
and we have some 30 uh, you know, employees. Some of those people are seamstresses making clothing. Uh, some of them people are, are making other kinds of objects from the 18th century. You know, maybe they're making pewter buttons or uh, belts or, or whatever that is. And then we have people shipping boxes, people uh, you know, doing customer service. And then we have this whole department uh, that, that is media. So uh, mm -hmm. the, the folks that do editing, uh, folks that do camera work, do audio work, uh, have been and have been doing this for quite a while. So Aaron's been basically, you know, the the main editor person for like 12 years now. You know, part of the time he was gone, but he came back. So we've got a, a deep uh, experience with doing things. A lot of people see the channel and they think it's just me, right? Because yeah, right. there's a lot of YouTube channels where there's just this one guy and he, you know, he sets up his camera and it's like, no, there's a, a lot of people that make what we do happen. When I first got hired on, one of the encouraging things for me was realizing that I think at the time, the person who was next in line for the, like, the employee that had been here the least amount of time had been here, other than me and Aaron, had been there for like 12 years. Yeah, yeah. So some, some employees that you have have been here for 20-something years, yeah, right? right? And, and uh, I know that we, we didn't always have this separation between retail and video i spent a lot of time making things and mm -hmm. then started helping with videos and stuff too you do a lot of that like you're not just john the video personality right what what kinds of i mean what makes you excited about the retail side of the company is it the product development what what mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. fun about that for you i get bored easily and I know other people do. And, and so I want uh, both for myself to be able to do what, what excites me next and uh, people who work for me. So a lot of people have moved around in the business. They worked with us for a long time and they, they might, you know, it's like, I want to make this item for a while. And it's like, okay, I'm done making that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have somebody else make that. We have certain products that always go to the newest person. It's like, uh, give him that one to make because I'm bored of it. Um, but we have uh, it gives people a lot of flexibility and a lot of fun uh, to work at towns, and so we do have a very low turnover rate because yeah. you know people want to want to stick around. We may not be able to pay a lot, but we get to have a lot of fun sometimes. Uh, yeah. So you know, me, I, I want to be able to. I like making different products at times, developing the products itself. I love the the the. Let's learn how we can make this particular thing. Where can I can get the parts? How do I get the tools to make this? Do we make it in an 18th century fashion? Do we make it in a 20th century fashion? 21st mm -hmm. century fashion. Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, learning about how to make the things from the 18th century and now learning about how to tell people things in the 18th century. And mm -hmm. I feel like there's always some new inventive way. Maybe nobody's done it yet, right? We've, we've done some just amazing experimental things. Sometimes mm -hmm. they work, sometimes <clears throat> they don't. And uh, you just never know what's next. I love when the two things fuel each other, and that happens a lot, it does. right? So Brandon started here as as somebody who didn't clock in and out, but just made things for us, and right. and, and we sold them at the catalog. He made leather things, mm -hmm. and then I think his first video was the Elmbark canoe, right? right? When we were like, uh, "Hey, we might have a full time position for you. Let's mm -hmm. try this out." And he's still he'll like be downstairs in the basement making clay pipes or making right. molds for. A metal product, and then and then I'll go downstairs and say, "Hey, can you shoot a video tomorrow?" And right. That's what and, we do. And we'll need products for a video, right? Yeah. It's like, well, uh, for this video, I need a wooden shovel. You know, what are we? Well, we're gonna have to make one. Oh, well, why don't we make a video about making the wooden shovel? So uh, there's a, the videos and the products and the things on the other side are driving each other all the time. So we'll get a new product, we'll be able to use it in a video, or we'll need to make a new product. Should yeah. we sell this? Should we sell this item if we're using it for a video? So yeah. it just, you never know. I have personally always loved working with like grassroots operations and small businesses. I love like DIY ethos and I play music and it's something that it's like, it doesn't really pay, pay off or pay the bills, but it's something that I just love to do. And I know for a long time, this YouTube channel couldn't have been feeling very successful right at times is there is there something that can you speak on that like 
what kept pushing, what kept pushing you to make content for this? Well, I am very much uh, a, a DIY kind of person, right? I yes. really like to do... You might be do... the most DIY yeah, right, right, right? So I really like doing those things, and I, I, I love both history and technology today, right? Both historical technology and high technology today. So, you know, I, I enjoy cameras and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, at the beginning of the channel, it luckily, at the beginning of the channel, it was very, very um, uh, purposeful. It's like, we need videos to explain how to use this particular product. So I had a really good excuse <laughs> to get into making videos, right? So I was like, how do I use this particular product? Okay. And the best venue for that at the time was YouTube. Uh, YouTube was nothing like it is today when we started. I mean, that was, right. uh, yeah. I mean, nobody knew what YouTube was going to be. YouTube didn't know what YouTube was going to be. And so we started doing just simple um, instructional videos for products. So people who would, had already bought a product. That's a very small audience um, that we were yeah. really aiming at at the beginning. And so it had a very purposeful uh, idea. It, we knew that they were paying off because uh, we could just tell people on the telephone, oh, you can find a video. It's much easier for me to explain this to you in a video, so go and watch this compared to trying to explain something on the telephone. You just can't do it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, you know, I, we immediately wanted to have fun. I like to have fun with my projects, so we started doing funny videos. And then that, the drive for a funny video is just to make a funny video. And at the time, nobody made money on YouTube. YouTube didn't make money on YouTube. Right. Uh, so we were just having fun making videos. And, you know, you would try to make a popular video, right? So there were, you know, big popular videos in the time period. Um, but there was no, as we call it today, monetization for that. They just, people viewed them and... Uh, we thought maybe if we had a popular video, people might want to buy our products. I don't know why. There's not that many people that really need tricorn hats. <laughs> but regardless, um, but but after a while, uh, we wanted to continue to make products and we, or continue to make videos, and, and we were trying to make them more and more informational, um, sort of as a drive, saying maybe what we need to do is uh, in, inform people about history. Um, because that's what we should be doing as a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's what our job here is in video land. And again, we were continuing to make videos a long time just as passion. It, they, they really weren't a, a profitable thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, there was always that way out there in the future. Maybe someday this will be a profitable, you know, <laughs> operation. But it, it wasn't that way uh, for many, many years, um, you know, more, more than 10 or 12 years of making videos uh, when it's just like, well, this is what we really should be doing. And there was a lot of investment in getting better and better and better at making videos uh, because I want to make things better and I like high yeah. technology and because that's what we should be doing. We should always be striving to make uh, a better video that instructs people better, looks more beautiful, is you know, all that. So did you did you have periods of time where you're like I'm gonna stop this? I'm just not gonna do this. I wanted to stop, not not inside, but you know monetarily. <laughs> I had to relook at that, uh, you know, every three or four months and say, is this worth it? Okay. Is this really uh, worth the the amount of effort? Because it's not just money, right, or wages or whatever, or expensive equipment. Some of that is, I only have so much time, and is should I be spending my time doing this thing or should I be concentrating someplace else? Right. And uh, it was painful to watch, you know, do, do that assessment every time and say, no, we're going to, we're going to keep going. Mm -hmm. And, but you've, you've always, you've, you're a photographer and you're mm -hmm. a fantastic photographer. You've played with cameras for a long time, even developing your own film and that kind of thing. We've had the print catalog. You, took most of the pictures for that, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. And then there was even the VHS tape of the coffee making. Mm -hmm. when, when did that come out? Do you remember? Yeah, back in 1994, 95, okay. we did cooking episodes with Dave Taylor. Oh, I was I, all I was behind the camera. I didn't even know that there were more than one. I thought it was just the one coffee right? video. With no, no. Oh, there was okay. a whole, like, hour and a half long program, multiple dishes. Okay. Uh, so we did lots of stuff. And that was all Dave. just on a VHS tape that right. was sold we, in the catalog? Yeah. 
that's neat. That yeah, fun. yeah. So there were video projects before before YouTube. Okay, now let's. We're, we've already said okay, the, you're a DIY guy, and <laughs> this can kind of be a punchline sometimes. But let's talk about Crimson Bond. Mm. Let's talk about what Crimson Bond was. What the takeaways are from that? Okay. Um, we did a bunch of funny videos and uh there was at one point where we ended one of the funny videos and it it was it was a little ta- a little kind of you know uh take off of the lord of the rings a little scene from that sort of but put into the 18th century and we had a lot of fun with it but it was funny because um as aaron was editing it he he stopped the video at one point so, you know, you could tell that there was more of the story, but you just you didn't know what it was. And we immediately said, oh, we need to do a series of these funny videos that, that, turn, that tell more of this story and, and keep going as a serial event. And, and we continued to work on that uh, concept for a little bit and said, well, wait a minute. This could be an entire movie. You know, we'll have our own idea here. We just, we had just gotten new cameras and they did a beautiful job. They did an incredible job. So we were like, we've got the equipment. Let's do this thing. We were crazy. We were crazy. And uh, so we took that, that, that little tiny concept. We, we came up with the whole story. We took an entire year basically off of YouTube. <laughs> while we, I'm while sure we, YouTube loved that. Yeah, right? <laughs> while we wrote the story and then we shot the thing over an entire time period, and then we, we took you know all this time to edit it, and we had special music for it. We just went all out, and we divided that up. Uh, we put it out as a, as a full length sort of movie, and then we divided it up on YouTube at the time, and it was. I mean, I look back at now, it's a cringe factor 100, right? <laughs> but we learned a massive quantity as we were doing mm-hmm. that because we learned how to use our cameras. We started to, to change our concept. This isn't a video, this is cinematic, mm-hmm. right? So we completely changed our, our idea about what we wanted this to look like, what we wanted it to feel like. And so all the videos after that were affected completely by the technique that we needed to use, the equipment, the sound that we wanted. It it changed everything, uh, even if the project itself wasn't successful in its immediate outcome. And you can see that coming through in the videos immediately after. It's no longer just, um, it's no longer just a video that feels like, oh, there wasn't a whole lot of, they just wanted to deliver information. Right. But you're thinking about, okay, how are we getting into this? How are we getting out of this? What is the camera movement going to look right. like? And, and then there's, there's a feel that comes along with it. And right. A lot of the videos that we put out now, people comment on how the videos look. Mm-hmm. We're an information channel. That I don't know if a lot of information channels get those comments. They might, but that's always still surprises me. It's like, when I think about the YouTube channel, Oftentimes, I just think about it like, oh, they, people want this historical information or they want the cooking information. But I think a lot of people watch it because of how it looks and feels. Mm. Yeah. All right. What's with nutmeg? I mean, maybe if people see a picture of you on the internet, they don't even know your name, but they're like, that's the nutmeg guy, right? What's going on with that? Uh, you know, it, it was uh, a completely natural and automatic. There was no nutmeg concept stuff going on at the beginning of our channel or even in the middle, even probably until the third or fourth season of the cooking episodes did that become even a thing. But the, the deal is, is that nutmeg is the 18th century spice. We yeah. do 18th century cooking. And if you look at an 18th century cookbook, it's like everything. It's crazy. Yeah. Everything <laughs> has nutmeg in it. It's weird meat dishes yeah. and dessert dishes and dishes you would never expect. Let's put it in oatmeal. Right. Let's put it in scrambled egg. Yeah. We put it in everything. <laughs> so it just became a natural, it's like, okay, and here's nutmeg again. 
right? And people started asking questions. Why was the nutmeg in there, right? Why, wh wh why do we keep seeing this? Are you putting this in as a joke or something? No, it's always here. <laughs> so it became a natural joke for the question, came, a natural joke for the, the channel. People were always asking questions about it. And it's just so 18th century that it, we might as well bring it out as our mascot. So we're gonna have a little nutmeg with, you know, like a Mr. Peanut. He's got Mr. <laughs> Nutmeg. And he's got a tricorn hat. Yeah. And, you know, that's. I mean, I don't know what to say. It's just that's what Nutmeg is like. It's been fun to play with. When you, when we were talking about the tavern concept for the live streams, and you said let's call it the Nutmeg Tavern, I was so excited about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Like that fueled the project for me. That was going to be so much fun to have the Nutmeg right. Tavern. And it has been fun to <laughs> sort of take that. It's like, well. Uh, let's own it, you know. Yeah. If nutmeg is that popular, let's just own it and and uh, go with it. And every time it shows up in an in a, in a cooking episode, it's like, here's nutmeg again, guys. Let's just put it in and have fun with it. Even yeah. and it is one of those sort of lost spices, uh, not used very much today in cooking, except for a few, you know, pumpkin spice. It's in there, uh, a few oh. special things. But uh, boy, we don't use it like they used it. Woo. Oh. No, I, the, the ones that make me laugh so much are, like, you take a chicken and you're going to roast it, season it with salt and half a nutmeg. <laughs> okay, so this might be awkward. I'm going to ask this question anyways, and you can answer however you want to, obviously. But at this point, you are a recognizable face. I've seen memes of John Townsend, <laughs> jokes. I've been with you in random places when people recognized you. So that is a thing. Is that super awkward for you? Does it even affect you? Is it just like water off a duck's back? How do you feel about that? Early on, it was. It felt a little awkward. I am a very private person, uh, very introverted, and uh, you know, some people think it's like, well, John's this excited guy, <laughs> and really, I'm a very, very quiet person, and and uh, not. Ex I expect to hide in a crowd, and I have had to change how I interact with people. Because it's like, I know that I might be in some random grocery store halfway across the country and somebody's like, John Townsend, and I'm okay. <laughs> you know, I have to, have to have fun with that. And it has been um, a learning experience for me, a growing experience for me, uh, learning how to interact with people uh, in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. But I've had a lot of fun with it and met some amazing people. I think that you should carry individual like little bags with a nutmeg in them so when you meet people randomly you can right. like, here you go <laughs> that's that a good idea nice. i should do that uh where we are with the channel right now we're still challenging ourselves we're posting more often we've started townsend's plus we're creating more content than we ever have when's when do you, when does it stop when? I, I don't know. I want to do my very best to make sure that even if I can't make videos for, you know, 20 or 30 years, somebody else can, right? So uh, it's, it's, my, it's my, my job is, is to go as long as possible or maybe the kinds of videos that I'll make, you know, way in the future are going to be different, right? Mm. For now, uh, you know, I've got the energy to keep making. I can cook for a long time. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and, you know, trying to work with folks like you and Brandon and, and uh, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm excited about the, the, uh, the challenges that we continue, right? We don't, we, we don't say, oh, that's good enough. All the rest of the videos are going to be like that. It's always, how can we make this next video that much better? Can we make the sound better? Can we, make, yeah. can, we, can we get some new visual techniques? Can we make completely different kinds of videos? So we just started with the videos that don't have any, any talking in them. Uh, just yeah. started experimenting yeah. with that. And it's a completely different concept. But everyone on the team, Aaron and all the camera guys and the editing, uh, it's like we're, they're all excited about learning new things. I love learning new things. Yeah. And uh, so we learn new things historically. And we new, learn new things technically. And what YouTube is like. And even Townsend's Plus where we say, okay, this is something even different. How do we, right. how do we create content for a, you know, this kind of audience? So there's so much to learn. I feel like we've only just scratched the surface. This is a question that I know that you don't want to answer sometimes. And I, I definitely, okay, I'm projecting. I don't want to answer sometimes <laughs> because I don't want to kind of uh, give a promise that I can't fulfill, right? Mm -hmm. So this question is not at all saying that we're going to do this. This is just talking, right? 
but are we going to build a ship? No. Yes. No. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> kind of. What do you have any pie in the sky projects? They're like maybe, just maybe we could do that, and it would be awesome. I know that there the n- none of them are pie in the sky anymore. Well, that's We've true. We've already done pie in the sky, which means that we know we can do just about anything. It would be fun to build a boat. Yes. I don't, the only reason that we can't, can't, is because where are we going to, we don't have any water right here. (laughs) Well, we can dig. We're so (laughs) close. Yeah. (laughs) Other than a boat, which would be so much fun. Are there, are there any things that you think about, like, maybe we should take that on that aren't really associated with cooking or the homestead is there is there another kind of area that would be fun for you well i mean next on the homestead could be you know we could do a log home an actual you know hewed out two-story yeah. or a story and a half uh you know we what we built is what you would build immediately and live in for a two years and then and then while you were building a bigger house uh, that's a possibility. Uh, there are also some great industrial projects that will be worked on. We have just this tiny little blacksmith shop, but it would be fun. We, we just did some research on mills and the big gears. And, oh boy, I want to do some of that. <laughs> so there are some really uh, bigger projects. Sometimes it's much more efficient for us to go to a historic site that's already done that work. Um, and sometimes we make it a twofer, right? So we'll go to a historic site, do the research, do videos there, talk about them, and then come home and do the project. Yeah. So we have done. Um, I don't know. Is there a is there a project too big to take on? I don't know. It's it's tricky. Yeah. There. There. Sometimes I feel like there's the thing that fuels you. Like I read something like this in a book, and I want to do this thing. And then other times. And, and that's more adventurous, right? And then other times it's like, no, I really want to learn about this. And the only way to learn about it is to do it. So I, it, I, I know that there are both of those types of projects. And I think the I want to learn about it, so I need to do it, yeah. are probably more approachable. Yeah, so. and there are some that are big projects, but they, they would be doable. Um, like doing traveling down Cresswell's. Uh, oh, don't tease me! Right. On that. I so really imagine that. starting in Pennsylvania, yes. and going down the Ohio with yes. dugout canoes, and going up the Kentucky, and wow, wow! And those would be doable. Those We've would... talked about that for a long time. Yeah. I really would love to do that. I just there's some of that's scary to think oh, about it too. Is. It's it just is. like wow, that's right. That's it, a trip. It, 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 it seems simple in the book. It's like, well, we just did this thing. Yeah. But, we're just going to huff this. That river right. is huge. <laughs> I mean, you can, that's scary stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We can't cover how we come up with all of our co- kinds of videos, I guess, because it's just, it varies too much. But cooking videos, that's something that we've done for a long time. And I think for the most part, we have down to a science. Let's talk about the process of coming up and, and making a cooking video. It's a joy and a torment. <laughs> because we have put ourselves into a schedule and say, you know, you, you need to have a video this week, John. What's going to go on? What's going to go on next week, the week after that? And uh, so it's, it's like, quick, come up, come up with an idea. That can be very, very difficult. I spend a lot of time just sort of meandering through cookbooks. Sometimes I'll be reading other things from the 18th century and they'll give me an idea. Oh, I wonder how they did this or here's this person in history and he's eating this particular dish. Let's, let's uh, find that yeah. and cook that. We don't do that as much. Most of the development of a cooking episode is we're looking through random cookbooks and saying, oh, well, that's something we cook every day. Isn't that interesting? Or, okay, what is this? Right. So we have different sorts of videos that, that we all do as a cooking episode. Sometimes they even work backwards and we'll say, we'll look at a modern dish today and we'll say, Are there, is there an 18th century ancestor to this? So there's multiple different ways to do it, but it's mostly just going through lots and lots of cookbooks. And luckily we have all these wonderful English cookbooks and a few other French cookbooks and American cookbooks from the 18th century. And we can just dig and dig and dig, interconnect them, 
uh, look to see how it changed, look to see how, how a food might change through history, mm -hmm. and we start figuring it out. And sometimes it's a puzzle that is just impenetrable. But usually <laughs> we get down to the, you know, somewhere close to the center of the solution and are able to, you know, put out that. Some of them are impossible to do, but uh, most of them we can figure out something. Do you feel like it's morphed over time? How so? Okay, let me. I'll phrase the question like this. For me, I haven't been coming up and helping with cooking videos for nearly as long as you've been doing it. And so, at first, it was really easy for me to just come at videos for recipes that I was already familiar with. Mm -hmm. what, like it's like okay, chicken wings. I know that pork yeah. chops. I know that. And and uh, now I'm kind of moving away from that. It's like, that's not as much fun for me now. I want to research this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Does that happen with you? Do you get tired of finding them one way and, oh. and start looking for them in a different way? Yeah, I, I really, you know, kind of go through phases where sometimes it's like, okay, I need a quick, I need a quick uh, a recipe here. I have some kind of go-to ideas, uh, you know, looking through a particular cookbook maybe, or I think it's time to do a French one. Let's just dig in that cookbook real quick. Uh, but I, I really sometimes really want to switch over and say, let's look at recipes from a particular person or place, or, you know, um, we had some fun looking at recipes of um, food that's mentioned in uh, literature. So, yeah. you know, what's, right. what's, what are they cooking in Sense and Sensibility? Is mm -hmm. that an 18th century dish? You know, and kind of locking it in with different things in history. So uh, I, I really like to kind of switch those things up and not kind of stick too much. I, I like to, I get bored. I want to keep moving around. So there are some videos that you, they just, it just happens. Like, yeah. I remember beef stew. Yes. I was flipping through. I was like, I need a recipe. I need it to be hearty because mm -hmm. uh, we haven't done mm -hmm. anything hearty in a while. Something with beef, open it up, boom, beef there stew, we're doing this tomorrow. Then there's- Great video. <laughs> it's fun. Um, but then there are the stockfish. Well, let's talk about stockfish for a second. Stockfish and other ones like that, that's, a, that's more about the ingredient itself. And there's a, I mean, that can be really tricky. A lot of fun research. You want it to be a little difficult to get the answer. It's no fun when it's easy, you know, it's right, right there on the surface. I want to have to dig and stockfish was one of those great ones and getting the stockfish. No, you can't go to the store and get stockfish. So, you know, we have to order up this giant box of stockfish that comes in and they think, you know, it's like, who put the dumpster in the back room? I will never was, forget the day like, that came Whoa, in. what is that? <laughs> uh, great episode. Great kind of food. We've had a lot of fun with stockfish. But I think the most amazing ones are ones like baked onion. Oh, <laughs> baked onion was right. incredible. I'm just looking through the cookbooks and there's just like two lines. Boop. Hey, you can bake an onion like this. What? What? I hadn't heard about that. And, and we said, oh, it's just sort of a throw off episode. It'll, we'll just do that real quick. Let's just, let's just do that episode real quick. And, and it was a lot of fun. It was just me and Aaron and we're, we're in here and it's like, well, let's, uh, we've already done two episodes. Let's do this uh, third one. And it's like, Okay, Aaron, this is what we're gonna do. He's like, what? You, you can't just do that. It's like, yeah. And he says, okay, we'll do it like this. Just, just say, you know, just walk in with the tray and boop. And, and we had so much fun with that. It was so easy to do. And we were even packed, we packed up for the day. And yeah. I, was, I was looking, the baked onion was over there on the countertop. I don't clean this place up very often. So, you know, sometimes the food will lay around a little bit. Don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> And the baked onion was still there. He had already packed up his cameras and everything. And, I, and the light was coming in through the window. And I said, look at that. Isn't that amazing the way that looks right there? As a photographer, you know, you're always right. looking at yeah. the light and everything. I said, look at that. And he's like, you know, that would make a really good thumbnail. And he just takes his phone out of his pocket. <laughs> like, oh, takes man. a picture of it really close. Like, okay, maybe. It was the perfect image. Oh, I love it's it. so amazing. That was just one of those episodes that just <laughs> falls into your yeah. hand. And you, you think it's going to be a throwaway episode. Nobody's going to care about this. And it goes crazy. It's, it's just like, I love that story because 
typically, <laughs> typically we finish the dish and I get out of the camera and I take 250 pictures yeah. to have Trying the, to get the perfect. I need, I need a really good thumb here. <laughs> yeah. And that one is just like, oh, let me grab my phone, click. And it's such a good thumb. Yeah. I mean, even if the video didn't do well, which it did great, but even if it didn't do well, yeah. it's one of the best thumbs on the channel. It's just yeah. great I thumb. love it. I love it. <laughs> Well, I've had a lot of fun today. Thank you so much for sitting down and doing this. I, I know I mentioned it to you in passing, kind of like, oh, that might be a fun idea. Right. And here we are. So thank you very much. Thank you guys for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for watching.